Welcome everybody to this very special Royal Automobile Club talk show in association with Motorsport Magazine. I'm Nick Trott, I'm the editor of Motorsport and today I'm joined by features editor Simon Aaron and an online content assistant Jack Phillips. And today we welcome Emerson Fittipaldi, one of the very greats of global motorsport. Emerson became the youngest Formula One world champion in 1972 in only his second season in F1 and followed that with success two years later in 1974. Emerson went IndyCar racing in the USA in the 80s and 90s, winning the championship in 1989 and the Indy 500 race twice. And as recently as 2014, uh, Emerson, you raced in a round of the FIA World Endurance Championship um, in your home country, I believe. Um, and this year, Emerson has revealed, revealed the Fittipaldi EF7, a supercar to take on Ferrari and Porsche. Emerson, it's an absolute pleasure to host you here at the Royal Automobile Club. Thank you for joining us. Well, Nick, thank you very much. Thank you. It's, uh, it's, it's a fantastic uh, moment for my life. I always see that uh, it doesn't matter how old you are, you always have a new challenge in life. And I always had the dream to build a GT car since I left Brazil. First was to be a Grand Prix driver and then to build a, a GT car. It took a long time to, to come to the second dream. Uh, but I started five years ago testing all the GT racing cars. I test the Austin Martin, the Lamborghini. I raced the Porsche, four races, the Porsche GT3. Um, I test the Corvette. I, I race uh, the Ferrari 458 because I want to absorb, to get all the, the best ingredients from the cars. Um, I found a need to myself and to people all over the world we call ladies and gentlemen's driver's car. And that's the, 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 the origin of the, the, the project I have now. Sure. And it took me you know, l a long time to to put on my mind the concept of the car. And the concept's intriguing, isn't it? Because it has a life in the digital world before, it has, before it's had a life in the analog world. So can you tell me about the relationship with Gran Turismo and how this came about as well? Well, it's, um, when, uh, it's, it's a long story, but I try to make short. I went to German, to Hans Werner Ausfred, who is the founder of IMG and now has HWA, who is the race division for Mercedes on DTM and uh, all the Mercedes GT3 cars are built there. And I'm, I'm very, I had a very long relationship with Hans. I said, I want you to consult to build the car. He said, Emerson, come back a month. And I was surprised, say, I can build the car here. I said, but so the Mercedes say, I can build the car here, Emerson. Come back, we can make it a project. I said, that's very good news. And he showed me all the, I mean, they have an incredible facility in Stuttgart, next to IMG. Yeah. And then I say, with all the respect I have for the, for the Mercedes, for the German cars, I like Italian design. <laughs> and, uh, and he made, he started laughing, he said, you're going to spend a lot of money. You know, you should not, we have a good design here. But anyway, I took one of his director, uh, Stefan Schneider, to Pininfarina. And they love it. Mm. I mean, Pininfarina has so much history. It's eight, seven years old. Um, Paulo Pininfarina say, I can design your car because uh, Marchioni from, from Fiat just split mm. from Pininfarina to, to have their own styling Ferrari studio at Maranello. And then arrived the right time and the right place. Uh, the Germans like the idea. And Pininfarina uh, loved to design after his, after the design the last uh, Ferrari is the first non Ferrari car they yeah. designed, yeah. and they have this very good relationship with um, PlayStation, yeah. with Gran Turismo, because the the EF7 is really a Gran Turismo car. Yeah. And then the, when the Japanese saw the car, they say, well, it's going to be in October. PlayStation, and I was very happy with this combination. I mean, I, I call the the dream team. For me, it's a dream team together. Yeah, the German engineering, the Italian styling, and, and your input as well. So I was, I was looking through some of the statistics of the, of the car, um, and, and you mentioned that hopefully it'll be testing later on this year. Um, so we have a V8, a naturally aspirated V8, 
And is it any coincidence that this car has a naturally aspirated high revving V8 when so many of your success is in Formula One because of the DFV engine? Well, you know, all the, the, the supercars that I test, most of them are turbo. And the turbo is a fantastic engine. I like the turbo, but the turbo, it can surprise you on a, on a corner because, the, you know, when the turbo comes in, it really put a lot of power and uh, then you can start slipping the wheel and uh, you lose the sideways grip. Yep. And uh, for some gentleman drivers who doesn't know how to drive properly, I think the normal aspirated is much more fun because the normal aspirated car you drive the throttle and the steering wheel together. You compensate, you know, through a long corner, you can touch the throttle and drive the car, make the drift mm -hmm. uh, perfect. And it's much more fun. And normal aspirated, I think, is uh, for me, is a dream to have a normal aspirated. I want <laughs> many race of V8 <laughs> normal aspirated. Do you, do you still, I get the impression that you still enjoy performance driving as much now as you did when you first came over to Europe in the late 60s? You know, Sam, a good question. Yes, I enjoy every second driving a car, uh, more as a gentleman driver with the age I have now. And that's the reason why I want to make a very forgiving, very easy car to drive. Um, my next dream is to race the car at 12 hours Sebring or 24 hours of Daytona in America with my two grandchildren. Wow. Because Pietro is 21, he's uh, doing very well this year in World Series, he's leading the championship. And I have another grandchild called Enzo, who is racing in Italy for the Ferrari Academy Formula 4. You know, in two years he'll be 17. I hope in two years I'm going to get the car to race. I told the kids, I say, you, the 12 hours, I drive half an hour, you guys drive 11 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's not, I mean, you, you, you need to do Le Mans, surely. I mean, you've, you've won the Formula One World Championship, you've won the Indy 500. Surely you've got to go for a class win at Le Mans. No, Le Mans, I, I, Le Mans is too expensive, too complicated. <laughs> you can <laughs> just drive for one hour. Up. We need a huge sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> We we'll certainly give it the company. Press. We look for more simple races, uh, but uh, Sebring and Daytona is a classic in America. Easy, much more easy to go. I mean, Le Mans would be another big dream. <laughs> the, uh, I Possible too big for me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned the gentleman driver side of things as well, and actually. Um, there is driver coaching available further down the line. Is this something that you've done before? It, mu it must be incredibly brave of you to, to want to sit next to somebody who's maybe on the gentleman side of the driving experience. Well, you know, when I, I drove the McLaren P1 GTR in Spa and then in Austin, Texas, it's a fantastic car and, and some of the owners uh, is incredible car, beautiful uh, handling, beautiful, performing, but is to a very high driver's ability. Mm -hmm. And I think when, when you have a more simple car to drive, you can coach and be more comfortable um, and more enjoyable, easy to drive. Um, if he's a very good driver, he they can drive like the McLaren P1 and have fun. But you have to be really uh, a much with much more ability to be able to enjoy the car. I think that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because many modern supercars are trying to impress people with their overall speed and not necessarily about how they make you feel. And for you, it sounds like it's very important that it's how the car makes you feel inside is the is the key. I, one of, one of the challenges I give to Hans Werner was I want the li the lightest GT car in the world because coming from formula background uh, every time i drove the gt cars i feel the the, the extra weight um, it changed direction it's not as quick it's not as forgiven um, and that that's one of the challenges i want a very li extremely light car and uh, for sure racing for colin chapman many years colin was extremely um, on the limit of weight on the cars, and that's 
And on, on my car, it'll be, we have only maximum, I want to accept 1,000 kilos. I want it to be below 1,000 kilos. Okay. And that, presumably, that means a carbon fiber chassis, carbon fiber bodywork, everything carbon fiber. Right, okay. And a fixed seat as well. That, that saves weight, doesn't it? The yeah. Having a fixed seat. It's fixed seats. We adjust the pedals, the steering wheel. Um, the carbon fiber chassis is extremely safe. I made the side of the, the carbon fiber chassis more to protect the driver's body if it, there is a like a T-bone crash, someone coming. If someone spins, the other car can hit. Uh, we don't have rollover bar, everything is carbon fiber with um, all the FIA safety requirements. It's the first full GT car in carbon fiber, like a safety capsule for driver and passenger. Um, is this the innovation of the car? How much of your time is being taken up by this project at the moment? Because you're an incredibly busy man, you travel around, you're still involved in racing, but how much of, of your time is this, this, this project taking at the moment? Well, it took me a lot of time since five years ago, and I, I say now is the time to do it. Well, mm -hmm. If I don't do now, I'll never do again, <laughs> because of my age, my experience. Um, and the last two years, I've been a lot to Stuttgart, Torino all the time, away from the family, but you know, the family know that's important. And uh, it took me a lot of time, yes, but I called the dream team to work in, in Italy and Germany has been fantastic. The people very motivated to do the project. Um, they are giving all they know with a lot of um, motivation. I think it's very important to have a motivation like uh, one day I took a picture, there was 16 guys working around the model at Pininfarina at one time. I mean, they're all looking for every detail, ever. You know, and Paolo Pininfarina is very enthusiastic about the project. And yeah. uh, that's, I call the dream team, and uh, I have a very good team behind. That's probably more people than you had working on your Lotus when you started in Formula One, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, normally it's three mechanics <laughs> <laughs> and calling. <laughs> so has this car been designed around some competition rules? Do you have a, a series in mind or will you just race it wherever you can, do you think? Well, we start as a gentleman driver. I, didn't, I, I was not looking to race. And then Uli Fritz, who is the CEO of HWA, in January come to America. I, you know, I started the project in Florida. And he said, Emerson, the car is looking so good for racing, you should homologate for race. <laughs> when he said that, I say, well, why not? <laughs> <laughs> but for sure, it was, uh, the first I idea was not to go to race. It was just like a, not even club race, but just our own race to take the owners to, to the racetrack to have fun. But now we are thinking homologate to race the car, yes. It's very much in, in your blood, isn't it, to, um, to work on the engineering side as well. I think many, many people may not be aware that before you even came to Europe, you were actively involved in, in engineering cars. There was a twin-engine Volkswagen Beetle, is that correct? So tell us about some of... <laughs> Nick <laughs> knows a <it> lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to know about that. I have to know about the Beetle. But maybe tell me a little bit about before you came over to Europe and maybe whether some of that time learning about how the car works and the engineering side has helped you throughout throughout your career well i always i always liked the mechanical part and when i was 16 years old i started um, a go-kart factory called mini that still is still racing you know uh, nelson pk race ayrton senna everybody drove mini go-karts the factory i started nearly 60 years ago wow. um no 53 years ago, my calculation. <laughs> <laughs> but, and after that, I built uh, with my brother f our own Formula V cars. Yes. I won the Brazilian championship of the go kart. Then we are selling to clients to, because m my father was a motor race journalist and mm. we know it's very expensive sport. I was working building cars, carts, and the cars to sell to. Uh, to other drivers and keep us racing. And then uh, we had the idea to build a, a twin engine um, <laughs> Volkswagen. 
we got two two engines uh, and it was like a, a flat eight cylinder uh, we put we had a gearbox a Porsche gearbox uh, we, we made a mid engine but the outside it looks like a beetle we took mm -hmm. our fiberglass okay. body uh, was very fast car but we had a mechanical problem but was like the, uh, the car only weighed that time 50 F uh, 580 kilos wow. was extremely light. Yeah, uh, was fun to drive. Difficult. <laughs> I was going to say with two en two engines, was it twice as dangerous as a standard Beetle? <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun, and uh, and then we built a, a, a prototype with Porsche engine. We call Fiti Porsche with two liter Porsche engine. We broke the lap record in Interlagos, Did you? and then we have our Formula One team, you know, Cooper yes. Yeah, but they always like. And when I left Brazil, I had all this dream. One day, I'm going to build a GT car. Yeah. And that's where we are now today. Well, I think that's th th that's a nice actual segue because before we started here, you told me a, a wonderful story about flying into the UK in, in in '69 and actually had a similar feeling today. Maybe you can share that share that with well, our listeners. You know, when when I flew in '69 to England first time, I remember I was landing Gatwick. And there was a was a, a, a cloudy day, and then the w there was a gap. There was a hole in the cloud. I saw the grass, and uh, on my mind, I said, "This is the land of Jim Clark, the Bram Hill, Jack Stewart. I mean, so many good drivers." And and England always being the, the the heart of racing globally. When you go to you know every weekend in England, you have club races. I mean, there's so much enthusiasm about the racing. And I had that feeling. And today when I'm thinking, I'm going to the Royal Automobile Club of England. With so much history, so much tradition, so many, you know, car manufacturers famous. I mean, the history, Rolls Royce, Lotus, Bentley, Austin Martin, Mini, uh, Cooper, Mini Cooper. I mean, it's names that come, Jaguar, you know, the Jaguar, the history. It's a fantastic history after the war. And they said, my car is there, the Royal Automobile Club. It's a challenge. It's a startup. You know, a small company against monsters, you know? Yeah. It, it's true. I mean, it's difficult to come today with a new car, you know, new manufacturer, with, you know, in, including McLaren now. McLaren is always a, yeah. they did a fantastic job. Yeah. You, you know, the new McLaren is a fantastic car. And it's a challenge for us. I mean, mm. and uh, it's an honor for me to be here today presenting the, the EF7 uh, in England, you know, where it's so much tradition, so much history. So I'm very happy, but it'll be a big challenge ahead of us. Which felt like the bigger challenge, coming over in 1969 to become a professional racing driver and succeeding, or coming over today as, as, a, as a car manufacturer? It's a very good question, Simon. In 1969, was a known quantity because I didn't know how I was going to compare to the European drivers. <coughs> I only raced in Brazil before. It was like, I, I don't know how be my level of competition against, you know, the professional drivers. Uh, today, I know it's a calculate. I know it would be tough because all the established GT cars in the world, I mean, they're all fantastic cars. And uh, to challenge is difficult, but today is a known quantity. I know that's going to be tough. I know that's going to be a challenge to build a, a really good GT car um, because the competition is very tough. I know the risk that time it was unknown quantity. It's a good, very good question. Did Did Pietro have that same kind of feeling when he came over a couple of years ago? Because he spent a long time in England himself. I think Pietro uh, knew that the challenge as a driver, that he knew he, he could be very good. Uh, I think it's different from when I come. There was no other Brazilian driver, no other... You know, I, we, we didn't know how to compare to other people. Pietro now knows. But Pietro's biggest challenge for him is the pressure of the name. You know, it's, it's tough on them because 
<laughs> when we finish second, third, the people say, only finish second, third. But he's doing very well, I'm very happy, he's uh, taking the pressure. I think, you know, like uh, Damon Hill uh, did a fantastic job. It's always very difficult when you heritage a historical name to go into race for the new generation. It's a tremendous pressure. Uh, Pietro, always, uh, I mean, I always, even I'm not watching, I, I, before the race I call him, after, before qualifying, before practice, anywhere in the world, because I, I, I try to keep up, to take his, the pressure. And my other grandchild, Enzo, who is racing for Prima Formula 4, has another tremendous pressure for the broad and for me. It's always difficult. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, of course, the, the, the spotlight, of course, wasn't on you in 69, although I did find in our archive the very first time that you were uh, mentioned in Motorsport magazine. And if you don't mind, I'll read a short Good. extract from here. <laughs> I, don't, I never read it. <laughs> and I can promise you it's positive. <laughs> so here we go. The most important championship from a purist point of view is the National Formula 3 Series. Um, then it goes on to say, um, a new name has suddenly appeared on the Formula 3 horizon. A 22-year-old South American named Emerson Fittipaldi arrived in England from his native Brazil early in the season, acquired a Formula Ford car and instantly got himself noticed for some very fast driving indeed. And then it goes on to say, um, and there was a race here, the gold leaf cars, and there was a you needed to pick up two championship points to win the title and a hundred pound prize, which I'm sure was uh, made a big difference. Um, but it basically goes on to say that uh, the Brazilian were naturally generated a good deal of excitement among Fittipaldi's extensive entourage of fellow countrymen who are apparently reporting back to South America his every move, relayed via the newspapers to an avid public, just as Fangio's activities were from the beginning of his European career. So that's... That, that's absolutely, I didn't make that up. <laughs> that's the report from, from 1969. Um, but w were you aware of your, how your success was getting back to Brazil and the impact that your, your successes was having back at home? Did, was that aware, were you aware of that at the time? I was, and, and the one thing that was, um, was amazing when I look at the 59 here, that's fantastic to have it here together with my new car. I look at the past and the future. You know? Yep. And um, not many people know, but uh, Ralph Furman was my mechanic. Uh. And it was his first job as a mechanic. And he, he's the, the son, the brother-in-law of Jim Russell. And uh, I remember when, when Jim Russell came to me, he said, well, I have my brother-in-law. He never worked in racing, but he can help you as a mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, he did a very good job. <laughs> And the driving, the, the Lotus was, again, um, was new, uh, was exactly this, you know, the Lotus that's here today is the one that launched me as uh, the, the international image because everybody at that time watched the Formula 3 championship in England. The British Formula 3 championship was important. And all the Brazilian media started saying, well, Emerson is leading, Emerson is winning, can win. I think the last race was Brands Hatch, and it was incredible coverage for the Brazilian media, because it was the first time a Brazilian driver was out of Brazil winning races on important championship. And it was fantastic to, to be able. And I spent you know, many trips, many hotels, you know, trucks in Mallory Park, um, everywhere in England. You know. With with Ralph Furman, <laughs> was you myself was and Ralph. Yeah. Yeah. Was your father giving you good coverage in Brazil? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and my Positive. father had a um, a radio um, program and a TV program, but you know my father was very uh, discreet. That he didn't want to talk too much because being the father, I always say. <laughs> The father of a driver and the mother of a miss is a problem. <laughs> but my father was very good. He was always behind. The only time he lost his balance was when I won my, my first world championship in Monza. He was broadcasting live. 
Can you imagine you see the, the son winning the world championship, first time for Brazil. He was very emotional. And uh, I still have the record from his, uh, the last five laps in Mons is incredible to hear. And uh, he was over revving. <laughs> 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 you for sure. Imagine. Um, I'm going to move on to some reader questions. Um, we've, had, we've had so many readers' questions, one of the best responses we've ever had, and actually um, Lotus comes up inevitably. Um, and the first question from Brian Gehrig, um, how was your relationship with, with Chapman and also with Peterson? So if you can tell us a little bit about your relationship with, with those two. Well, first, you know, I, I told on the lunch today, I remember, when I won the British uh, Formula 3 Championship, first year I was in England, Colin called me to have a meeting. And I, I look, I wa you know, Colin was sitting on his desk, I was on the, f on the chair, and I'm looking and I'm thinking, this is Colin Chapman, I'm talking to Colin Chapman, my legs start shaking. I was so nervous. And he said, Emerson, I want you to sign next year to drive Formula 1. I was only drove Formula 4, Formula 3. And uh, was my intuition, my instinct was controversial shock. I say, if I accept and I cannot deliver, it will be a problem. Or I take a risk to burn my career. Yeah. And then I say, first I say, Mr. Chapman, I'm not ready for f Formula One. I would like to have Formula Two before. And I was expecting his answer. And then he said, OK, Emerson, you, you, you run half season next year from La Tour and we can start the British Grand Prix. Good. <laughs> 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 that was my first meeting with Colin. I never, s uh, and when, you know, Jim Russell was in Snetterton, you know, driving Lotus, everybody was telling Colin, you know, what was happening. And then Colin wanted me to drive. And then the same same month, Frank Williams flew to, he was learning how to fly. He flew to Norwich, I was, I was living in a small house in Norwich. And uh, Frank called me, arranged a meeting, and said, Emerson, I want you to sign for me with Piers Courage. Uh, yes, and uh, I have both. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then he took me to De Tommaso, Italy, who was making the the Thomas Williams. I spent a day in Italy. It was a very nice project. Everything nice. But I told the same Frank. I said, Frank, thanks, but uh, I'm not ready. And um, in 1970, I was, I was always a very good friend of Ronnie, Ronnie Peters. 1973, oh, I would race against Formula 3, Formula 2, and then Formula 1. 1973, he joined the team. Uh, and. He's one of my best friends in Formula One. And he had, uh, when he had his crash in 78 in Monza, it was to me, to, to my family, a disaster. And by coincidence, uh, August 12, in Stockholm, is the avant premiere of Ronnie's film. I'm going there, oh, and okay. I'm a big part of Ronnie's uh, life and, and yeah. Nina. Peterson, uh, Ronnie's uh, daughter, because she was so small, she never knew the father well. Mm. And when we had, a, when I participated in the film, she keep asking, "How was my father?" I must tell me, it was I had so much fun to participate. It would be a, it would be a, a, a good production from from Sweden. It's a yeah. good, I mean, it would be similar to to Rush, mm -hmm. but made yeah. by by the, the Swedish team. I'm looking forward to see the film. They have a fantastic coverage about Ronnie's wow. uh, life. And I, I'll, be, I'll be there in, in Stockholm. It'll be that fun. Sounds incredible. Yeah, it'll incredible. be fun, fun. Was, th was the, the, the rivalry you had on track with Ronnie, um, can that be compared with the rivalry, rivalry you had with Jackie the, the year before? How, how did they compare as competitors? You know, to me, uh, if if you ask who was your your worst enemy, most difficult driver on the racetrack, for for sure, Jack Stewart. I mean, he was a fantastic driver. Yes. I would say Jack Stewart carried the car on his back if the car would not perform. 
I mean, he's always on the limit, fantastic driver. Uh, Ronnie was a friend, a very aggressive driver, um, incredible style of driving. Uh, I was having fun to have Ron on the team. We were very open for the setup, for everything. And we, I really enjoy working with Ronnie, but he was a fantastic driver. Ronnie Peterson was world champion material. Sure. And it didn't happen, but he had the capacity. You know, s and in on the English history, it's like Stealing Moss. Yeah. yeah. You know, Stealing Moss should be world champion, but it didn't happen. Ronnie should be world champion. Too. Sure. I must credit James Vickers for the previous question. Apologies there. Um, this is from Jackal. Um, I've read previously that you felt the Lotus 72 was the best car you'd ever driven. Is that so? And what aspects of the Lotus 72 made it, made it your favorite? This is 100% correct. And, and the, the Lotus 72 was a car that I could talk to him. He talked to me. He was, he, he was part of my body and I was part of the 72. Uh, I drove for four seasons. Uh, we had a very good 1970 when I first raced. 71 was a very difficult year mm -hmm. because when come the slick tires, mm -hmm. increase the grip, and this we start having um, what I call suspension deflection. Mm -hmm. And then we lost some, 71 was very difficult year for us, but the end of the season, we got the car working again and 72 was fantastic. I mean, it was the best car I ever drove. From all the cars I drove on my career, yeah. if you ask, it's still, yes, 72 was the best car. And I, I believe, did recently, did you have a, have you driven the 72 a few times in, in, and does it feel like you're putting on a glove? Does it, does it still feel like that when you? Uh, they took the 72, as I think, three or four years ago to Bahrain before the race, and it was the first time it was a safe track with a lot of runoff area that I could drive fast. And I told, I told <laughs> Clive, I said, Clive, can I drive fast? <laughs> he said, yes. <laughs> and then we start, I really was driving fast. I had to learn the track because yeah. I never raced there before. But I was enjoy. it was like my memory was going back, you know, the smell, the pad or the steering wheel, everything was, I was back again the proper way. And they stop the demonstration and what happened i, I didn't stop oh. i did another <laughs> two slaps <laughs> they had you, to you red flag, the flag. <laughs> is, that, is that the only time you've been red flagged or, <laughs> or black flagged <laughs> because when you drive like in goodwood it, yeah. i you have the feeling to be back in the cockpit yeah. but you don't have the feeling cornering braking feeling how the car was it was yeah. the only time since i drove was in bahrain a few years ago, I think three years ago, it was a lot of fun. Wonderful. Just <coughs> you mentioned 1971. I mean, and you um, during that season, as well as driving the 72, you also raced the um, the turbine car. Well, I mean, you drove in two Brands Hatch and Silverstone, the non-championship races, and then Monza in the Italian Grand Prix. How did you feel about that project? I know it didn't last for very long, but I mean, what were your feelings about it? I think it was a big challenge. Uh, to calling to, to, to make a turbine Grand Prix car. I, I told today to Clive Chapman on lunch, um, the first time I watched the car running was well, John Miles at Hassel. They had um, the local racetrack, small racetrack, using the runway for airplane runway. After three laps, John Miles break at the end of the street. I was with Colin Chapman watch. He doesn't stop, goes through the fence, <laughs> into the cattle field. <laughs> he comes back white, no brakes. <laughs> and uh, we had to order from Lockheed, huge pads, he, huge brake discs that didn't exist at that time because you, you have to stop the car and the turbine. The turbine is always when you back off, still the, the turbine is pushing the car forward. And then was was um, I had the alarm on the dashboard, a red light with sensors on the pad. Uh, if the red light goes on, come in. But no brake pads, and it was a big challenge. Um, to all the cars that I race, that was the highest risk, 
for a driver to drive the turbine on a, on the a road circuit, on the Grand Prix track. And you raced it at Monza, the fastest track of them all. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the car had a huge fuel tank because that time you didn't stop. Yeah. The car was very heavy in the beginning of the race. And uh, through, the inf through the chicanes, through the Ascari corners, it uh, was quite slow because they have fuel. But knowing Colin Chapman, he was a genius. I knew if you continue, that car would take over Grand Prix racing. It's just a question of time, engineering, uh, develop the car. And then uh, by the end of the year, F because we race after Mons, we race in Hockenheim on the Formula 5000 race. And I was extremely fast in Hockenheim. It was the second really uh, challenge to us. And then I think FIA look mm. and told Colin, no turbine cars in Formula One. But there was, uh, you know, Colin was, was uh, incredible. He was a genius. Uh, he'd found a solution to make the car very fast. Was getting there. There was, um, did you, you raced the car at Brands Hatch as well, is, is that right? 71, I think, yeah. Um, my father was there, he interviewed you. At <laughs> 71 <laughs> at Brands Hatch, absolutely. So very, very circular. <laughs> um, and what he said, it drew a crowd um, because it was quiet. <laughs> Usually a racing car draws a crowd because it's noisy. But he said he's never seen anything like it, you going into paddock with this thing just whistling. Um, but he sensed that there was, there was brake, <laughs> there would be brake <laughs> issues with the car. Well, <laughs> I, <laughs> Brands Hatch, there's another story. I was the end of the straight. Um, I break the end of the straight, the rear wishbone broke, the rear wheel turn. I made the 360, didn't hit anything, I stay on the asphalt, and um, the rear wheel was off, I went back to the pit very slow, <laughs> dragging the rear wheel, but the car was was unknown quantity, uh, we didn't know how much G would have the suspension. I mean, it was uh, that's why I say it was a very dangerous car, but was incredible. We could hear the engine, the, the tire noise on the corners instead of the engine. <laughs> like a road car. Mm. You could hear going around the corner. And that was fantastic. Let's, um, let's get forward to 1973. We have a question here from Simon Wilson. I attended the 1973 Canadian Grand Prix with my dad and three brothers. I was 11 at the time. My brothers and I still have a laugh about the chaos after the pace car came out in front of Howden Ganley. Um, I'd love to hear your memories. And do you believe you were the rightful winner? Okay, thanks, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Peter was the team manager from Lotus. And um, at that time, we didn't have electronic score. It was all, you know, visually watching and make, you know. And when the, 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 the pace car came out of Howden Ganley, we won the race. They took me to the podium. They give me the trophy. They start commemorating. Then they say, no, 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 no. Emerson <laughs> won out of the podium. I say, come on. <laughs> That's a good question. It happened. Yeah. And it was a joke because I went to the it's podium there. and then they took me out. <laughs> and Peter War still convinced that I won the, 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 the Grand Prix. But the time score was against us. It was a confusion with the pace car. And, uh, you know, it's very disappointed for a driver to, to commemorate, yeah. to go first place at the podium, <laughs> receive the trophy, then you have to give it back. <laughs> it's unfair. <laughs> but I, mean, I think that, that race reflects more than any, perhaps, how the modern world has changed, because now everything, all the information is instant. I was 12 years old at the time, and I was desperately trying to find out who'd won the Canadian Grand Prix. It wasn't in any of the British papers because the time difference and no one, there were all the arguments. Nothing was in the British papers and by Tuesday, no one cared. And I had to wait till Autosport and Motoring News came out on Thursday to actually find out who won the race. It took five days to discover that. You know, it's, it's just a, it was a completely different world. You know, the, 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 the news today, everything's so fast, so much more quick than it used to be. Um, you know, it's big change, big change. You know, my, my, my son is um, 10, he's racing go-kart. He's, he's learning, you know, te like telemetry. He looks, he's the best lap 
goes on the laptop and you can see where he's losing, <laughs> where he, you know, how much he's gaining or losing and breaking to his teammates, to yeah. the other driver. It's amazing. I mean, they are learning now six, seven, eight years old, things that we never dreamed to have at that time. I mean, there's so much, everything mechanical, everything even team manager to the driver was, you know, Colin Chapman working with me on the setup of the car. There was no any electronic information. And I, I remember many times the, the car was not correct. And then I went with dinner uh, Saturday night with Colin. And Colin keep asking, tell me how was turn one, turn two, turn three. And then he, Colin used to put the two fingers here and listen like this, concentrate. I know what to do after, you know, my and uh, he went back to the garage. Next day was a new car. I mean, he was fantastic. His intuition to set up the car. And today's everything is electronic. I can't believe you didn't have telemetry on your Formula Ford Merlin. It's extraordinary. <laughs> it's extraordinary. But I mean, you, you, you mentioned your youngest son who's karting. I, I believe you're, you and he are traveling around together in a motorhome going to, going to I mean, what? That must be like starting all over again, isn't it? You know, it's incredible, these kids now, you go, uh, for me, it's going back to go-kart, yes, yeah, start from zero again. Um, different go-kart from my timing. Uh, extremely competitive, uh, many talent. I mean, these kids, uh, my son raced in Sao Paulo yesterday. We just got the plane, he's here today. <laughs> But you see these kids, you know, 10, 11, 9, dicing, wheel to wheel, sliding, four wheel drift, overtaking, breaking, touching the other. You know, it's, it's amazing how younger they are now and learning so fast what I was learning when I was 17, 18 years old. They are learning 10 years younger than we when we started in the 70s, on the 60s race. It's amazing the difference. And there's so much talent to these kids, the way they, they learn. I mean, it's amazing, amazing. And they are going, uh, yesterday he was hitting, you know, in miles, 65 miles, you know, 110, 120 kilometers per hour. Seven years, eight years, 10 years old kids. You know, it's amazing how yeah. changed racing. Yeah. Do you, do you feel, uh, looking back on the late 70s, do, do you feel you were, a better driver in 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 the Coppice car that you drove in the in the late seventies than you were when you were in a car that was front running at the beginning of the seventies. How did how did your driving change, if at all? I, I always say in life, um, I think any sport, every new experience you are learning, you are getting better. And in motor race, every kilometer, every mile that you do on the racetrack, you are learning. As long as you have the motivation to give the hundred percent of yourself, you always can improve. And I think through uh, experience, you get better. Even if the age is working against you, you have a balance. And the athlete has to know when the curves start going down. You know, but. I had some of my best races. I didn't win. I was running third, fourth, and uh, I'm sure a lot of drivers have the same experience I have. People say, "Oh, he won the race. It was a fantastic race." But possible, he had a much better race when he finished third, second, fourth than winning. You talk about age working against you as you get older, but. You retired from Formula One, stayed away from racing for a couple of years. Then you did the sports car race in Miami, and next thing you've got a brand new career. I mean, what? <laughs> I mean, you you'd Said retired. Said you like to challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what what was it that what was it that sort of a what was it that persuaded you to stop initially, and what was it that persuaded you actually that was a bad idea? I'm going to start again. In '98, uh, if you remember, was the full ground effect cars with the skirt down, and the full ground effect cars, to me, was beyond the driver's limit. Um, any fast corner, to try to explain what happened, if you take 
turn into the corner one mile, two miles, or three miles, or in kilometers faster, the, the result of the downforce would be much more big, would accept, but we didn't know where was the limit. And um, when you lose, you lose it. Or if the skirt on the curb is stop and you lose the, the low pressure under the car, you crash. And I, I was not enjoying anymore. Um, we, we had our best car with uh, Harv Postweight, and Adrian knew it. It was his first job from Adrian on a Formula One car. Um, and we lost the sponsorship in Brazil. I was very disappointed because we had the best. A Formula One team is a good team as long as you have good people. The people makes the team. It's not the team that's going. I mean, we, and we had Peter Ward as a team manager. Keck Rosberg as my teammate. Uh, Harv Postwaite, who was a fantastic engineer, design. And then Adrian knew it as a junior engineer, but already come with some good <laughs> aerodynamic ideas. The car was an incredible car. And, but I lost motivation after 1980. I, I had some invitation to continue Formula One. I went back to Brazil, and then Ralph Sanchez, uh, who organized the Miami Grand Prix, said, Emerson, I want to drive the spirit of Miami, and I always, I always want to, to race again. And I went there, and then Monday after the race, um, American Cuban go, I, Pepe Romero say, I have a v very Cuban accent, say, Emerson, I have a indie team, I want you to drive for me in Indianapolis. And going back to the Colin when he won with Jim Clark. I was a teenager in Brazil. It was a very big news. Team Lotus go to Indianapolis, win. And on the mid 50s, 60s, I used to have to watch documentary films about Indianapolis from Bardal, Buvukovic. Uh, um, there was a, lo a lot of big names just before AJ Foyt. And I watched Indianapolis too when I was a teenager. Actually, when I was still less than 10 years old. And then I keep asking Colin, how was the experience to race in Indianapolis, winning with Jim? And to me, it's always integrate. We call it Colin like people. Some people hate, like the drivers. Some drivers hate Indianapolis, some drivers love it. There's no halfway, or you love or you hate Indianapolis. And you can read it, the hate in Indianapolis. But I always, when I had the opportunity in dinners, I keep asking Colin, how was to race in Indianapolis? Bobby was in Indianapolis, Bobby Dennis. He was here today, too. He was with Jim Clark there. And then, on the back of my mind, I said, I always want to race in Indianapolis. And um, I had the first experience. And, and then I said, I'm going to do like three classic races per year from Indy. And then it turned out I did 13 <laughs> seasons, <laughs> four seasons. Am I, am I right? I, if my notes are correct, 74, you tested a McLaren Offenhauser? Is that right? Um, that was, that's obviously a good decade before your, your indie career really kicked off. But why did, that, why did the McLaren Offenhauser test? I, 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 my notes say that you enjoyed driving the car, um, but it was fragile. Well, in 1974, I just won the, the, the World Championship at Watkins Glen. They flew me to Indianapolis. I drove the John Rutherford's winning McLaren of that year. Um, I had a very good coaching from A.J. Foyt when I arrived in Indianapolis first time. It's very interesting. I remember I said what I have to do and not what I should not do. It. And then on the back of my mind, we coming from where I come, I never could do it. Say, oh, Emerson, if you lose the back end, turn the steering wheel to the inside, the car spin to the inside, don't hit the wall. But how, you know, the reflexes, the reflex, the opposite. I always correct, but anyway, that's one of his number one advice to me. And I enjoyed the, the McLaren, uh, it was a beautiful balanced car, I was getting the speed quite quick. Uh, very smooth driving. Uh, next year they want to race, uh, sponsored by Texco, would be the Texco star race in Indianapolis. But I refused because if you remember that year, we were already going 215, 260 miles per hour average. 
and then um, when they hit the wall, just disintegrate. The, the monocoque was uh, three millimeters aluminum, and uh, I said, no, I'm not racing the one. Now, eight, ten years, exact ten years later, was already carbon fiber yeah. that actually saved my life yes. in Indianapolis, yeah. Michigan Speedway. Okay. Um, we're gonna it's a lot of history. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, we're going to jump around now. We have so, so many questions, and you're giving some fabulous answers as well. Um, so we mentioned earlier on that what, there were some opportunities in F1 in the early 80s, and Oscar Matsarat um, has mentioned that maybe there was an opportunity with Alfa Romeo, and another one of our, our readers, um, oh, no, hang on, same guy, Oscar. Oh, he's very, very, well, very well informed, Oscar. Um, in 84, you drove a Spirit Heart, um, what are your memories of the spirit? Uh, did it help you choose to pursue your career in kart? And did you ever come close to driving for Alfa Romeo in Formula One? Well, it was very, very, very good question. The day I drove the spirit was the day that Ayrton drove the Toleman in Rio. I was with Ayrton. We okay. were having dinner together. It was my back to Formula One and this first Formula One experience. It was very interesting because the Spirit was a uh, was a very good car to drive. Uh, it had a heart engine, uh, was powerful, uh, but the team didn't have, I think, the, the sources to do a proper season. And I back off. Um, was already carbon fiber starting car that was much safer. And I was, uh, I was with Ayrton the same day when he tested the Toleman in Rio de Janeiro uh, at the racetrack. And Alfa Romeo made the offer for me to drive. Yep. But I, I didn't want to go back to Formula One that time, no. No, okay. Okay, right. Um, oh, we have so many questions here. This is, this is quite something. Um, here we go. I have the time. Are you Not sure? Much. Okay, we don't want to... <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> I'm conscious it's that you fun. flew in this morning, so uh, no, 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 no. More, more coffee, I think. <laughs> I have plenty of time. <laughs> so, Matt, in South Korea, here we go. International readership we have. Um, when you look back on your career, be it F1 or kart, which drivers stand out as A, your toughest competitors, and B, talents that were never in the right place at the right time? Well, you know, I was so lucky that I raced against three generations. One, the one generation before mine, uh, that was, you know, like Graham Hill. Jack was nearly one generation before mine. Uh, Jack Brabham. I mean, the fantastic driver. From that generation, the toughest was Jack Stewart, for sure. Then on my generation, there were so many good drivers. I mean. Uh, Nicky Lauda, Carlos Reutemann, you know, Nigel Start on my generation just before I finish. Uh, there was, you know, James Start, James Hunt Start too. Mm. Uh, was a lot of talent. All the way through to Jacques uh, Villeneuve uh, as well. In yes, in Gio Villeneuve. Yeah, yeah Gio and Jack, yeah. Myra Andretti. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, ra I race against the Sun. Yes. You know, in America I race against Jacques Villeneuve. I race against Michael Andretti. Yes. You know, the, f the answer family, the son. Yeah. Um, it's difficult to see, you know, there's so much talent. Um, mm. I would say on my time in Formula One, the one that really comes out to me, because what happened to him is Nicky. Because, uh, you know, when, when he had a crash in Nürburgring, uh, that w this is the, the toughest part of Formula One. I was in the hospital next to Nick's room. Uh, he was chance of dying. He was because he's, uh, he didn't have any oxygen on the on the blood because of the, he burned the, the lungs. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think it was Daniela Odetto, the team, man, team manager from Ferrari, called me and said, Emerson, come here, come here. There's someone on the phone who will talk to you. I went there and was Enzo Ferrari. Emerson, do you want to drive for me now? I mean, Nicky was there the same day and was a shock to me. And that's how tough is Formula One. And then uh, why I'm telling the story? Because we never expect Nick to come back in Monza. 
two and a half months after he had the face all burned and had the problem putting the helmet. It, to me, he was an incredible driver, Niki Lauda. From my era, not saying that there's no other talents, a lot of good talents, but his spirit to go back there, Monza, with all the pressure from Ferrari, after being burned the way he was burned, and then perform again, and after that winning the, the World Championship again. Amazing. To me, as, as an athlete, I have a lot of admiration for Nicky. Yeah. But he, his experience, I go back and, and win. Incredible. Um, you mentioned actually earlier on with um, with and Senna. Um, this is from Peter Book of um, I hope I've got that right. What kind of setup did Ayrton Senna like on his cars? What did you What did you tell during 1994 about how he was setting up his cars, and how would you describe his driving style? That's three questions. He's not allowed three, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, Ayrton always from go karting. He was always outstanding. He was always driving very aggressive, taking a lot of risk. He was always driving, what I say, near over the limit. And he was demanding on himself a lot. I knew Ayrton since he started racing go-kart, and then we were very good friends for many, many years. I invited him to drive in India with me. He drove my car. Uh, but he was always incredible, uh, asking much from himself. Every lap he wanted to improve, he wanted to improve. He was an incredible driver. Um, and Ayrton was um, second part of the question. If if I told in some setup, when they have the Grand Prix, the the Detroit Grand Prix, I was there when Ayrton won the race. And then it was in the race. I called Ayrton. I say, Ayrton, how was the setup you <laughs> use? <laughs> <laughs> this is true. He said, Emerson, because of the 90 degree <coughs> corners, put a lot of stiff roll bar, you break already, you have the back end helping to turn, and I won the race. <laughs> Tell Did he share his prize money? Peter, right? <laughs> yeah, that was from Peter. Yeah, Peter, Peter. Ayrton yeah. told me to set up, not me. <laughs> <laughs> For the truck. <laughs> um, okay, Tony Chan asks, as I recall, you were pretty good in the rain. Do you believe that the best drivers in the rain are also the best drivers in general? Well, I, s I think to drive on the rain, you have to have a very good feeling. Um, and driving on the rain is like driving slow motion because everything happens with less grip. The movements, everything, the car is, I don't say if sluggish, is that the right exp expression? That things are, it's like a film in slow motion driving the wet. We think it's the other way, but when you drive on the, on the wet, I, I think, that, you know, Ayrton was very fast on the wet, always. Uh, I was always, I, I, I had many wins on the wet, but the drivers who drive on the wet has a good feeling between the car, the track, the body, what feel the limit. Um, yes, a, a very talented driver normally should be very fast on the wet, yes. Did you, um, were you good in the wet before you came to England, or was it something you... <laughs> <laughs> good question, good it does rain in Brazil, yeah. It does, it does, but hard. it's <laughs> easier to... <laughs> you can rely on the rain learn. in England. That's a good question, because uh, we, we learn in England racing, or Formula Ford, Formula 3, all, any racing here, there's always a good chance of be drizzling, <laughs> wet, different conditions. It's true. If you get the history of any British driver, Always when rain is always running fast, yes, compared to the other countries. <laughs> Let's bring but ourselves. But you have, you have proper Sorry. rain in Brazil, though, don't yeah. you? I mean, the, the rain in Brazil is much higher quality than British rain. Brazil is thunderstorm. Um, and actually, a, in 1974, the British Grand Prix, it was my last Grand Prix win. It was sunshine, and then I see a black cloud coming towards the track. And I had experience in Brazil in racing that sometimes when the black cloud like that comes, is a lot of water. And I look, it's, it's going to rain. I think I was running second in the race. Silverstone was yeah. very fast at that time. 
and then uh, the cloud got closer. I st I went by uh, the end of the street. I filled my visor. Next lap, I come in. I was first to come in, and Teddy Mayer, the team manager from McLaren, put the wets. I went out. Big rain. Twelve cars crash. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you remember. I this. do remember very well. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. then I was so lucky, and then um, I, I come out of the pit. I'm going flat out on the straight. Very bad visibility. It was a big rainstorm. It was a thunderstorm. Yeah. And then I saw the back of a car just grow. He was going first gear with slicks, trying to go back to the pit. I missed by that much. And was um, Mario Andretti driving the Viceroy Grand Prix car, the American team. I'm sure Mario never saw who went by. <laughs> And when I was racing Indy, I say, Mario, do you remember Silverstone <laughs> 74, a car that nearly hit you and went like crazy? I was in top speed, you're in first gear, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> right, Formula One today, inevitably, there are some, some questions around the current state of Formula One. Obviously, we had a wonderful uh, race uh, yesterday in Baku. Andrew Ryabus. Uh, asks, what is wrong with modern F1? What should F1 change to become interesting and excited? After yesterday, I think we had a, <laughs> we had a good race, but ha what's your general assessment of Formula One today? Well, uh, you know, my general view of Formula One, uh, I think still the cars, they have too much downforce. And um, when a driver's challenge the guy ahead, if he's very close, you start losing grip in the front because the extra downforce. Mm. You start graining the tire. And then if, if you are able to pass on the two, three laps, yes, you steal the tires. But if you stay a little longer, you lose the, 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 the front grip. And then you have to back off. I think you should take some downforce from the front. Um, I think the, the public should be much more communicate to the drivers. The drivers should be more open, face, talk to the public. I don't know how, but be easy for the public to more have like access. More like cars or IndyCar, yes, more like in America, yes. yeah. And because it doesn't matter, but always the public, like any sport, they like to see the driver's reaction, the motion, the athlete they want to see. I think we are missing a little bit that in Formula One. Uh, the cars this year, I think they are beautiful looking. They are more muscle, the big tires. I like that. They, they are really nice car. I, I, I think we need to possible to make a shorter race. My opinion, two hours too long. Uh, the new generation with the gaming, with yeah. everything, they want everything to happen much faster. Yeah. They should make a shorter race, my opinion, or two races two on races. the weekend. Yeah. Possible one Saturday, one Sunday, or two races Sunday, I don't know. but should be more sprint race, yeah. to be more challenged, more dynamic. Yeah. You know, um, uh, I, I think Formula One has a fantastic future. Formula One is always Formula One. We're never going to change. Sure. But I think we need to make it more modern to the new, to the new generation, you know? Yeah. I took my son last year, I was a uh, steward at the German Grand Prix in Hockenheim. And between um, Friday to Sunday, he wanted to see all the drivers. His dream was to meet Lewis Hamilton, to Nico Rosberg, to be there. No, with me, I had all the, the ticket, the pass to go. He only saw three drivers the whole weekend, walking the paddock, that he could take a picture. I think we we're missing that. Yeah. And he was disappointed, leaving Hockenheim. You know, he's 10 years old, he wants to see the drivers, he wants to take a picture. <laughs> oh, daddy, you know, can we me see more? Can I meet more drivers? I think we're missing that. I think that's something WEC, WEC, which you raced in, which is, is you got that correct. And I guess you probably felt the same when you were probably getting mobbed by fans in Brazil a couple of years ago. So F1 should follow that same model. They should do it, yes, for the future, for sure. I mean, it's lovely. I mean, you're, you're talking about being on the grid at Daytona in a couple of years, but I love the way in the Daytona 24 hours, the whole 
public are allowed on the grid for I mean, it's if, if you're actually trying they're trying to work and take pictures you can't because you can't move but it's the access is fantastic i the seem to exaggerate <laughs> 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 i was there yeah. watching a few times I, actually i watched you in paul newman race when he was 82 mm. years old i'm not going to race 82 years old. i was gonna I say you've got another 10 years you've got another 10 <laughs> years in here yeah? <laughs> 12 years <laughs> But I, w I was there, I was amazing, you know, but that's in the interaction between public, the race cars, the driver, I think is very important, very important. How to do that was create a new system. Yes, I like that. You, you are right. So you, this interaction has to happen for the yeah, sport. We, we, just, we saw it at Le Mans as well, the driver's parade has now become part of the drama and excitement of, of, of the weekend. Um, we have a Le Mans question from... Um, Mikel Romatka. I'm sure they've given me really difficult <laughs> names because this is my first one. <laughs> Emerson, did you ever consider Le Mans? What do you think about that race? Well, there's an another question that's in 1965, the best Brazilian driver that was called Christian Heinz, that's why my nephew is called Christian, went to Indianapolis to race with Mauro Bianchi with the uncle grandfather of Bianchi mm -hmm. on the Alpine. And we all, all the Brazilian, you know, racing world was watching. First time a Brazilian driver go to racing them of chance of winning. And then um, just before midnight, you know, at the end of Musan Strait, he, he hit an uh, oil patch and uh, crashed the Alpine, the, the car blew on fires and he was killed. And uh, I was one of his biggest fans and to me it was a shock. Uh, and then always back of my mind, well, I'm going to race in, in Le Mans, it's too dangerous, it's too dangerous Le Mans. When they had the, before the chicane, it's still dangerous because of the rain, the night, different speeds of the cars. Um, I had one chance in 1988, I think, Nir Pash, Joachim Nir Pash was the team manager for Mercedes, want to do like in the team, I was going to be myself, Mario and Michael Andretti. Uh, and I, I s mentally I said, I'm going back to, I'm, I'm going to do the dream to race Le Mans. And then it was exactly the same weekend as Portland. It was June, always conflicting with Portland. Um, no, it was 90, because I was already driving for Roger. I was with Penske, but I, I accept the race would be with the near Pash Mercedes. But it didn't happen. Now it's too late. It didn't happen. I'm not going to race Le Mans. Go on. I don't think Simon <laughs> believes you. I think Simon's... No, no, uh, he's, he's I need to encourage you. <laughs> um, Jan, Jan Lammers was there. Jan Lammers was there. Yes, yeah, that's true. Um, uh, yeah. Lama's race this year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So never too late. <laughs> never too late. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you very much. It's been, it's been great to have you here. Thank you for your honesty in your answers. And actually, thanks for telling us about your fitted party motors as well on the EF7. It's going to be a fascinating project over the next few years, and, and we look forward to it. Thanks, everyone, for, for listening. Um, we look forward to catching up with you next time with another Royal Automobile Club talk show in association with Motorsport Magazine. Thank you. Thank you.